racing fan, Monday Morning Racer here once again for Drag Racing TV, brought to you by strutmasters.com, the suspension expert. And we've caught up on Zoom today with the 2012 PMRA champion in Pro Modified, and that is Mr. Eric Latino. Eric, look, hope you're doing well up there in Canada. I want to dive right in and say that you have got a beautiful black, blue, white trim pro mod. I was very impressed with it down there at the World North Slammer National. So look, give us the specs on your ride that you've currently got. Sure, man. Hey, how's it going, Lee? It's a, uh, it's a Tim McCamus. It's a 2019 Tim McCamus built car, but it's a 67 V3 body Camaro, the Tim builds. Um, built as a lightweight car. So when we built the car, we had Tim put a whole titanium back half, titanium hardware, titanium pretty well everything to get the car. So if we want to run some outlaw lightweight stuff, we'd be able to do that with the car. Um, so, you know, Tim became us, like I've had a G-Force car, Bickle car. They're all really good cars, but I really like the detail work from McCamus as well. You know, my last car that I ended up uh, putting in a wall in Las Vegas was the McCamus car. It worked really well. You know, we were qualifying three, two, one, four, all the races uh, near the end of that season. So when I put the car on the wall, I figured let's get a new car from Tim. And uh, so Tim built me a no real nice ride, really happy with everything he's done with the car. And uh, Al Billis and I have been working together for a long time. So I've always had Al Billis the supercharger. So we won the PMRA back in 2012 and we won the shakedown race in 12 and we won a lot of, quite a bit of stuff. And we won the PB, PDR race in Michigan, um, it all pretty well comes from Al Billis. Al Billis pretty well builds one of the best superchargers in the industry. And we've been working on a bunch of engine programs and we've become really good friends. So Al participates in all of the races that I go to. The only thing different this year, Lee, on this car is we put a torque converter in a car. And I've been a clutch guy all my life and I'm really having a hard time trying to figure out how to get that clutch and converter to kind of work this together. I just don't, you know, we think we know what we're doing and every time we try something, it seems to come better, but we can never get it right. You know, we're, we're just really having a hard time with this whole converter package. I keep threatening the boys and say, guys, we've got to get this thing and get a converter back and get a clutch back in this car. But as soon as I say that, everybody wants to first take it back home. Nobody wants to run the clutch car anymore. Well, it's definitely a beautiful car. Now, at the World Door Slammer Nationals, well, you definitely broke it in on all ends of the spectrum. You had a rather eventful Door Slammer Nationals. What did you think of the event for you pro mod guys? And tell us about your time down there in Orlando. So the event was awesome. I mean, what the boys put together there, the track, and, uh, and Wes did a great job, had a lot of cars there. We put a new engine program in the car and we just struggled. We just were too busy chasing the engine and trying to get the fuel system right that we decided to just pull the engine out, put in what we had last year, went out for Q1 and uh, <laughs> well, let's just say that I went a thousand feet, clicked the car off, pulled the chutes and the chute didn't deploy. So the car was going to the end and the sand was coming pretty quick. So I almost made it to the end, but I knew it wasn't going to make it. So right at the last minute, I just turned myself into the sand, destroyed the front end of the car, lower front right corner, and crushed the rocker panel. So the boys, the track were awesome. They got some shovels, dug the sand out of the way. We dragged the car back in the pits, stayed up till 2.45 a.m., getting it all repaired. My good old buddy, Brian Prince, sent one of the boys into town and got that flex tape taped the front end back together, did a bunch of carbon repairs. Didn't look the greatest, but got the car ready. And uh, so again, we went out for a Q2 on Saturday and we were just chasing the car, man. Just didn't make it. We just did not run well on Saturday. Uh, the guys were great to let us stay on Sunday and we ran on Sunday and first pass uh, when a 576 at 250. So. Would have been great if I would have had that on the first Q1. 76 could have been a 73, 72, and maybe in the 60s, but just didn't have enough time. I kind of messed, spent way too much time trying to get a new program working when I should have just focused on what I, what I was used to running and what I had last year. 
I was on the scene there in the pits getting some photos. Uh, the front end was definitely messed up, but y'all did a fine job getting it back together. And for a roughed up car, it still looked great. Got some footage of it on Monday with you all testing. Uh, did you come away from the Monday test feeling more confident, being prepared to go into Gainesville, even though Gainesville didn't happen? Oh, yeah. So we ran really good on Sunday. We went for one pass on Monday, but I had to go. I actually had to get going. I had uh, so with Global Emissions, it's a company that I run and we manufacture emission controls for the high performance industry. So we had a whole road trip planned, starting in Orlando, ending in Miami and seeing nine different shops. So I had my VP of sales come in. He flew in at 9 a.m. that morning. So I had a chance to get the car for one run. By 11.30, Albert and I were on a road show right till uh, right, working our way through to Miami. So, um, yeah, but I, I'm going to tell you, I was pretty confident that we would have ran really well in, uh, in, in Gainesville. So tell me, you know, plaster on the side of your car is that G-E-S-I, Jesse, from what I understand. That's your company. Tell me, what is it all about? What industries does it have its roots flowing into? So we probably have about 80% of the high performance market covered. So we basically supply these catalytic converters that don't rob any horsepower. So they're proven to be tested. So we got a few different models, whether you got up, up to 1200 horsepower. So a single cat can handle up to 600 horsepower. So we supply Cook's headers, we supply AMS, APR. So APR is a company out of Opelika, Alabama that specializes in Audis and VWs. Um, we basically make a metallic foiled substrate furnace braze that can handle temperatures of 950 C and it keeps them in compliance so it meets all the EPA regulations. And so from that, we ventured into providing emission controls for the big rigs, all the class eight trucks. So all the trucks you see in the pits from 07 onwards, they all have these particular filters on them. And we have a program that replaces the original equipment components with ours. We build a high flow system as well as a stock replacement system for the big trucks. Is that the uh, DPFX fit? Hey, you're good. You've been following, eh? Yeah, so DPFX fit. So we came, again, we wanted to come up with a brand name that the first thing the guy does when his diesel particular filter breaks down, the short form stands for DPF. He goes on Google and types in DPF near me. Well, that DPFX fit usually comes up first hit every time on Google. So, yeah, so DPFX fit is a brand. Uh, we marketed today. We partnered up. We have a distribution channel with uh, Keystone Automotive. So we're in five warehouses across the USA from Pennsylvania, working our way over to Seattle, Washington. And in Canada, we're in uh, 210 locations through the uh, UAP uh, Napa traction uh, stores. So doing really well with it. Truck in, the trucking part of the business is going real strong. Wow, from high performance to pulling those long loads, you definitely got your hands in a lot of business. But from what I understand, that's not all that there is. There's apparently also Redline Automotive. Yeah, it's funny. So I started an automotive shop back in 1985. I specialized only in hot rods and high performance application cars. Back in uh, when the C5 Corvette came out in 1997, we developed a twin turbo kit. So I'm actually a turbo guy driving a blower car. <laughs> But we built the first turbo kit, and then by 1999, our, our province or our state came up with an emissions control program that all vehicles had to meet tailpipe emission testing. So they put the vehicle on a dynamometer, run at 25% load, 25 miles an hour, and you have to keep your CO, hydrocarbons, and NOx at a specific level. Every catalytic converter in the industry uh, that you can buy were made out of ceramic, and they would liquefy and melt down. So we went out and endeavored to build one of the world's best catalytic Converter just to get our own customers' cars passed. So just with the customer base I had, I knew customers that were thermal engineers and just got them together one weekend and said, look, man, I really need to come up with a solution to get these cars to pass the emission test. I got people that can't plate their cars and can't transfer titles without getting the emission test. So about a year and a half of messing around with different foils and cell densities and all, we came out with one of the world's best catalytic converters, got our own customers to pass, and it slowly spread out. So Cook's headers, out of, at the time we were in New York City, and actually from Long Island, and they were supplying 
you know, really trick high flow 304 stainless steel headers and X pipe systems for your GM Ford and Chrysler applications. And they were just putting no cats on these things or just buying whatever they can get. So when those exhaust systems came to Canada, Steed of Canada, who specialized in Mustangs, he would chop out the cats that came on the cook system, weld our cats in there, get the car surpassed emission test. And he got to the point where he would phone up cooks and say, look, man, can I give you a dozen of these Jesse converters? And I want you to put them in all the systems that come to Canada. So Pops, who was the founder of Cooks Headers, God bless him, he passed away a few years back. Hardcore racer, been inducted into the Drag Racing Hall of Fame. Had, I heard, over 75 race cars. And um, so North Carolina came out with a program that you had to pass the mission test, same way we did here in Ontario. So he called me up and said, look, kid, I've got this, you know, Magnum SRT8 supercharged 406 stroke belt field that makes about 800 horsepower. You, can you send me a couple of cats? And if they work for my car, I might give you a shot of becoming one of our suppliers. So I built some cats, sent them down, put them on his car, passed the mission test, no problems. And today he is our number one customer. He buys more of these EPA catalytic converters than anybody in the industry right now. But it's spread out from Cooks to, like I said, APR out of Oak Lake, Alabama. Uh, we're now supplying Cobb tuning out of Texas. They're big into Porsches and the STIs, Mustang, STIs, um, working a lot of the EcoBoost 3.5 turbo uh, Raptors. And it slowly worked its way into liver noise and, you know, Lingenfelter. And it's pretty well now, I can tell you that a good 75, 80% of the industry is buying our, uh, our cats. They're also sold. So if you're a car enthusiast and you want to put these on your car, they rob no horsepower. That, that whole thing about catalytic converters rob horsepower, they do. Ours don't. You can buy them through, you know, Jags and Summit, Turn 14, Motivicity. Most of the performance industry distribution channels are now carrying our product. Thus, helping me go on racing, right? Hey, helping you go in racing. Hey, at least you are the cat king of catalytic converters and not tiger king that everybody's so uh, immersed with currently right now. And it's spectacular to hear that your story from, you know, starting an automotive shop has just continued to grow and evolve and expand. And you're out there racing with your brand and racing uh, well. You're a tough competitor out there in the pro mod world and in the drag, drag racing scene. And in HRA Pro Mod, though, I, I'm curious, from your perspective, what you see right now, who do you count that is the toughest competitor in that field? I'm going to tell you, you know what, like I was saying to Al, because Al's like, you know, Eric, like we got to get out tests more, you know, like we got a good program, but we can't compete. And I'll, I'll tell you who it is. Stevie Jackson, for sure, races for a living, does an unbelievable job, and he is really fast. Stevie Jackson, for one, for sure. Uh, Todd Tuttero is a real tough contender. You know, Mike Castellan is a tough contender. Pretty well anybody that is doing this on a full-time basis is doing really well. Steve Matuzic, believe it or not, near the end of the season last year, he started coming around. His car was really picking up the whole ass. I think we're all a threat. It's one of those things where, you know, if Stevie Jackson had a full-time job, and he had to go to work, and then he tried to race part-time, he would do about as good as I'd say all of us are doing. Because he's so loyal and dedicated to racing, he deserves to win because that's what he does for a living. Todd Tuttero races for a living. He deserves to win. Hell, guys like me and, you know, Jim Whiteley and Mike Castellana, Steve Matuzic, we love the sport so much. We come out. We want to win. We come out to play. We try to be as competitive as we can. But reality is, is, we don't deserve it because we don't put the time they do in. You know, does that make any sense? You know, you know I just think today um, any one of us can win races and win championships if we can put as much time in. And reality is we can't. So the guys that are on the top runners right now, they deserve to be where they are right now. And Mike Janice, you know, another great contender, was a world champ. And, again, there's a guy that can win again this year too, for sure. A lot of great competitors out there, and, you know, your perspective, I think, is especially valuable because, like you mentioned, you're not a full-time racer such as Stevie Fast Jackson, and I don't think a lot of fans realize that you guys that hop in these pro mods 
a lot of times you're fitting the bill. Yeah, sure, you've got great partners, but most of you are great entrepreneurs and you're good businessmen and you want to go out there and you want to have some fun and compete at a high level. So with stating that, I also got to ask, as I've asked other pro mod drivers, right now the NHRA has got that 12 event schedule, even though this year is going to be wild and crazy for sure. Is 12 the right number or can a few more races be eked out or less, you know, races even? I'd rather see 10. You know what's really hard? Again, 80% of the pro mod field, 80%, all have full-time jobs. We all work for a living and we go racing as a part-time gig. So if any NHRA really wants to get 35, 40 cars at every race, they need to shrink it to eight to 10 races so that we all have a chance in between because right now trying to run three races back to back it's almost impossible. How, how do you do that? I, I, we had, I believe we had Charlotte right to Bristol last year, one break back to another race. It's too difficult to do back-to-back -back races. So I think you need to sp spread it to eight races. Eight's a good number for us. Hey, for a full-time racer, 16 to 20 is a good number. But when you're a part-time racer, I can tell you, because I talk to the guys all the time. I talk to Jim Wiley. I talk to Steve Tuzik. We all say the same thing. If we can do 10 races with weekends in between, perfect. If they can't do 10, then they got to make it nine or they got to make it eight. Because we all want to be able to compete, run all the races and not miss it on any, any points, right? Because that's a big key thing too. So again, eight to 10 is a great number. 12, I think, was a little excessive last year for us. Really hard to do when you have a full-time gig. Definitely with that full-time gig, but also, your team, you being out of Canada, I've got to ask, what are some of the logistical challenges from getting to race to race? I mean, do, you know, do y'all get beef coming across the border with everything you're trying to get across? And you're yes. further into Canada than, you know, many may realize. It's still Ontario, but, but you're, what, hour and a half, two hours east of Toronto? So it's even that much more traveling. Yeah, so we're, we're a good hour. So we are about three hours to the buffalo fort erie border pretty close to your hometown um we're four hours to the michigan detroit border um so for us what makes it difficult is we bring our rig back after every single race so we went to get florida which is 22 hours and we come back then the next race we'd be going to charlotte it's going to be 15 hours and i'm going to come back and it's like 15 18 hours every time um it was really complicated crossing the border. We used to get held up for hours, sent back, returned back. We've learned really well. I've got a really great person within our company, within Jesse, that is our logistics coordinator. So Joanne's been awesome. So we use Livingston International as our broker. Livingston has a brokerage office at every crossing between Canada and the U.S. from the East Coast to the West Coast. And they've educated us well. So we get what they call a TIB, a temporary inbound bond. Our driver keeps a full log of every component that's in that trailer. We go to the border, they know we're coming. So as soon as we show up, the paperwork is submitted 48 hours before we even show up at that border. The guy at, at the border crossing knows by scanning our barcode, knows who's in the vehicle, what's in the vehicle, where we're going on the way back. Our driver, usually Pete Olin, pulls in to the U.S. side, walks in, hands his TIB in, they stamp it. The TIB basically means temporary inbound bond. You're allowed up to two years to bring anything into the U.S., and you got up to two years to bring it back. But when you bring it back into Canada, you need to go in and get those paperwork stamped to say, hey, I have my TIB, I've done my thing in the U.S., I'm bringing this whole gear back again. So it's painful, and it was in the beginning, but we got it down pat right now. We are, we are looking, Lee, into setting up a shop in Mooresville right now. Well, that's one of the major hubs. I mean, whether it's NASCAR or drag racing, drag racing, especially for the door slammer guys, y'all continue to have that hub growing around there in Mooresville. But, wow, man, the hoops. I figured you had hoops to jump through to get across the border. I have enough hoops in my little Kia Soul just getting across <laughs> the border, much yeah. less with a full rig carrying a Pro Mod. Now, 
you being Canadian, every person, no matter what nation they're from, you got a sense of pride from wherever they are. Would you like to see an NHRA event back in Canada? Absolutely. You know, John Force, do you know this? I'm not sure if you know this, Lee, or not. John Force won his first NHRA race in San Air, Montreal, Canada. So it'd be awesome to have it. You know, it'd be great to have a race in Canada. You know, there's Montreal. There's another racetrack, I believe, in BC called Mission. Um, it's far for us. It's pretty close on the West Coast, but... It'd be kind of cool to have a race in Canada, for sure it would. Yeah, I was surprised in Pomona, California, just how many Canadians I encountered that were coming to watch NHRA drag racing. They're like, this is, our, this is the closest event we can get to, and they were coming out of Canada to go watch drag racing in Pomona, California. And, oh, yeah, John always reminds us that Diamond Key wasn't there in Montreal for that first win, and he had to wait a little while. But, yeah, you know, I think it would be cool to see the NHRA back in Canada as well. I mean, you know, St. Clair, you know, St. Air had such a great history there for a while, was a premier event, and it would be great to see the NHRA traveling north of the United States border into Canada. So with that being stated, the NHRA, you're an entrepreneur. There's many other entrepreneurs out there. Do you feel like the NHRA really has an ear for you guys, or do you think they could listen a little bit better? Because there's got to be some great ideas out in the pro mod pits, just, just the pro mod pits, not even including sportsmen and the other pits, of some pretty intelligent guys to make enough money to go racing. So. Do you think they listen well enough, or could they improve that area? You know, look, I like the guys, that the, the guys that work in nature are good guys. We got to know that we become friends and all, but you're right. There's, a, there's definitely a big disconnect. There's a lot of strong entrepreneurs. You know, Danny Rowe worked really hard to get the RPM. The Real Pro Mod organization started back 15 years ago. Him and Stu Matuzic did a great job running that. Um, NHRA just treats us like a secondary sportsman show. And, you know, I love sportsman racing. I did it most of my life. But, you know, when you look at an average sportsman's budget, he might spend forty to $50,000 a year. Average pro mod team will spend a quarter million dollars a year. So we show up at a race, and they, the, the qualifying money's a joke. Like, look, there isn't one person in here that comes to a race to make money, but – it would be nice to get something like we get $300 to qualify to race. You know, it should be 1500 bucks to race. The winner should get at least $20,000. And HRA, I think needs to try to work with the racers and see if we can somehow pool the money together through the channels that we have to get some of that funding. They'll come in and they'll, they'll, they'll accept it. If we show up and say, Hey, we got this great deal. Hey, they got their hand open and they got their bank account ready to deposit that check. But in return, I just don't think we get enough out of it. And many people have tried, uh, you know, they got great money. I mean, mellow yellow puts a lot of money up for the purse and we got E3 spark plugs, which has come in and it, they've stepped up uh, a bit of that purse to top that up a bit, but you know, they opened it up. I had to bust my hump and go to every race. And, and, you know, I remember going to ATCO, bringing a car to APCO just so I can get enough divisional points so I can have enough rate points so I can sit there and sign up to become an NHRA, you know, pro mod, kind of a full-time racer. And what I mean by that, Lee, is that you have to have eight grading points by the time the season ends and you want to sign up for the next season's race. It opens up in January. In January, anybody with eight grading points can sign up for the whole season. Well, prior to that, if you've got seven points, you have to always wait a week out from when the whole circuit goes out and books all the races they wanna race. So half the time we couldn't even book to get ourselves in that race and we had to wait for cancellation. So you can't book hotels and flights and pre-plan. So any cherry opened that up and now they've made it open to anybody who wants to race any cherry is welcome, which is great. The problem is, is that if we don't have 35 cars at every race, they're charging back every race team, you know, an additional hundred to a thousand dollars per race on top of what they have to pay to race. 
I just think if, we, you know, they did a study and they went to all the fans and said, hey, guys, what is your number one class? What is your favorite class? And from what I was told, Pro Mod was number one. Funny car, fuel cars were number two. Pro Stocks were three. I believe fuel cars were four. So if we're so popular, why do we have to keep paying to come all the races and pay for a crew? And there's just a lot of money that we put out to go to these races. If it's that big, any jury needs to look at what the fans want and put the funding toward what the fans want to see. That's my thing. And I'd love to sit down and help the jury out. But the problem is they don't want to listen. I have a really hard time. They came up with these new rules. These safety rules are ridiculous. The stuff they made us do to do our cars and putting tunnels and different power adders was completely wrong. Even with a clutch car, they want a clutch car to have a complete enclosed tunnel. Look, it's a dead issue now. It doesn't matter what they did and what, what we all had to do was a big mistake. It's too late now, but I wish NHRA would actually listen and say, look, uh, you know, how many of you guys would like to join a committee? Grab five, six of the NHRA pro mod racers, form a board and let that board be the voice for, uh, for the team for an issue. Pretty similar to fuel cars. They have like a union type program. I'm not sure what it's called. It's called pro one or pro something. It becomes a voice for the, all the racers. Well, I know from the other pro mod drivers and tuners and team owners, definitely they, they have similar sentiments that the NHRA has got to help you all out more with the person. I mean, y'all are not just filler. People want to see high power door cars ripping up the quarter mile and y'all are not just filler you are definitely a part of the show a big part of the show speaking of the nhra allowing things in talk to me what's your sentiments on the pro charger being in nhra pro mod now i think i think uh nhra messed up there what they were trying to do and i get it they had blower cars turbocharged cars and nitrous cars. And they did a count and said, okay, we got 30 of these cars competing regularly at all the events. If we can now go out and introduce a Ford Power Rider, we'll have 50 cars at every race. And all they did was got every turbo car that used to be a turbo car converted to a Pro Charger. Now there's two cars left, Steve Matusik and Michael Beal. I don't think there's any more turbo cars left. Did I miss any, Lee? No, that's no. it. Yeah. yeah. So all they did was they took away the turbo cars. They brought in the pro chargers. And let me tell you, the pro charger cars are really fast. And they're going to be fast because industry doesn't know enough about them to govern them, to regulate them, to regulate the horsepower, to know what overdrive to change. So it's going to be a bit of a shit show, you know, chasing them. We're going to be going to races. They're going to overpower. They're going to go out and be four or five numbers faster than any other power adder. And it's sure you'll make a rule change, penalize them, and it's just going to be a dog and pony show all, all year. Well, let me speculate with you for a moment. You've mentioned already several times in this interview about the car count at a national event for Pro Mod. Other Pro Mod driver teams have mentioned that. And you with mentioning the Pro Charger here, you said, hey, they thought they could increase the car count. Well, if it's a 16 car field, is the NHRA kind of, in fact, just using the pro mod to make for a bigger, better show without allowing guys really to run for the big prize? Is that kind of what's going on? Is that what you're saying? Well, it, it, yeah, if you look at what we're doing, right, if you look at the whole deal, look at the whole day. There used to be 24 to 30 fuel cars. There used to be 24 to 30 funny cars, like top fuel funny cars. We used to have 25, 30 pro stock cars. Now you got between 14 and 18 cars. So during the qualifying sessions on Saturdays and uh, Fridays and Saturdays, there isn't enough cars in these classes to fill the gap in between the show. So yeah, if we can get 35 or 40 pro mod cars there, it'll just drag out the day and it'll be able to get them to run their five hours. They need to run from noon till uh, or 11 o'clock until five o'clock. And then on Sunday, it's easy. We don't want a lot of cars because they only have so much air time to run those cars. So they always have enough cars to eliminate the 16 car field. So yeah, it's kind of a big shot. I think there's too many cars. I believe NHRA 
should have left it the way it was. Hey, we all had our earn a grading points to run NHRA Pro Mod. It should have completely stayed where it was. I don't think it was a good thing for opening up and allowing all the other cars to show up. Because you're right, we're going to have 32 to 34 cars show up, and you're still going to see the same 16 cars, or you know, 18, 19, these guys are going to miss it, unless they open up the field and say, hey, we're going to have a 32-car field with five rounds, then it becomes a sportsman class. So they have to decide, is it a sportsman class, or is it going to become a pro class? I, I know for me, if I was running a team, that sounds like my chain's being jerked and I'm not really getting a fair shake out of the deal with opportunity to make the field. And, and at least if I don't make the field, make sure that I get some type of compensation at the end of the day when I pack up and have to go home instead of my, my team, my car, my resources being used. That's what it almost sounds like. That would be, that would be very frustrating. No wonder there seems to be the frustration in the pro mod ranks. Well, you got to figure if if the purse before was three hundred dollars to qualify, and they'd be twenty to twenty five cars, and now you're going to have thirty five to forty, you think the purse would be, you know, fifteen to two thousand for first round loser? You're still paying out sixteen cars, but you now just collected more money because now you've got thirty to thirty five cars paying to race that day, and each race brought in that much more money. It should all go back to the racers, but it seems like they're bringing more in and it's going back to NHRA, not to the racers. Well, 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 NHRA, NHRA. Hopefully one day in the future in drag race, we'll have all these issues worked out. Racers, fans, and NHRA will be happy. I hope that folks are truly working towards that. Now, earlier talking about the combination on your car, you mentioned that it's set up to do some running in some other uh, races and, and sanctioning bodies. Were, was that the plan for 2020? Maybe some PDRA, a few other groups? Well, you know what? Again, we did it because we felt that we didn't know what was happening with an injury. Injury was so unstable, and we didn't know whether the class was going to be around. If it was, are we going to enjoy it? So the car was built that for any reason we decided to pack up and pull out of NHRA, we can run the car in PDRA in a lighter trim. So. There but you I'll, go. Tell you, I'll tell you, Lee, I got that converter package. I'm going to give it one more shot. My car is built for a clutch car as well. We got a clutch. We got the dry shaft. We got a tunnel. We got everything we need to run this car as a clutch car. I know people think I'm crazy talking that way, but like I told the rest of the guys, Stevie's got 22 to 25 years experience racing the converter, and so does Totoro, and we got one season. I just don't have three or four years of my life to be beating up my stuff, trying to get my converter all figured out. So I'm going to give it one more shot. I know this interview and guys, when Al hears it and, you know, Paulo hears it, my crew guys, they'll say, well, why would you say something so stupid? It's not stupid. It's reality. We can't get the converter working. We're going to put a clutch back in that car. So talk to me in pro mod, leaving you know, with the clutch. I mean, from what I understand, a lot of people are not doing that today. You apparently would be a dying breed. So, you know, I know for you at this point, it's probably even a being comfortable factor, and you know what you're doing, and you know what can you, you can expect in the car. But what's what's the difference with the clutch and the Pro Mod to uh, the converter? So the only reason we changed over is because NHRA is starting to thrash us through the rounds. And because we're now we're part of the show and they're going to film us live with the fuel cars and a pro stock car during elimination on Sunday, they give us 45 minutes to get the car serviced. And every clutch to be consistent, you need to remove the tranny and pull the clutch out and recut it, deglaze it, and put a fresh pack in every pass. And it's impossible to turn a car around in 45 minutes if you got to focus on the clutch cool the car down, you know, go through the valve train and all. So I've been working real close with Leanders, and we've come up with a four-disc clutch that has a 61% less inertia because it's a smaller diameter. And just the way the design and the way they've made the clutch, they feel and believe that we can easily run four to five passes on that clutch and be as consistent as we would if it was a fresh pack. Look, let's just say, let me tell you this, Lee. 2017, that blue Camaro that we crashed in Vegas, 
was hauling ass. We were like I told you, number two, three at, at all the races from Indy on. That car had 150 less horsepower than we have today. 150 horsepower less today, and I still have not run as fast as that car did with my new car and my converter combination. So that's what I'm saying. If I can get the clutch in that car, you're going to see a really badass fast car, and you're going to see that car running at the top of the field every time. Now, it may not be consistent because of the fact that we got to service the clutch, but talking to Jorgen Leanders on the weekend, he's, uh, he's assured me that the new clutch will do exactly what we're hoping it's going to do. So we'll have it in our hands in the next couple of weeks. When the weather breaks here in Canada and this whole Corona-19 virus seems to calm down, we're going to do, put a few laps on the car to local racetracks here in Toronto. Well, I just had a guy go by me and thinks it's a local racetrack here on the highway, apparently doing burnouts outside. Man, <laughs> people are getting itchy under all these corona implications. Yeah, you mentioned crazy. the Las Vegas wreck. I watched it earlier today. Man, that, that was one of the hardest licks I have seen. What happened on that pass for it to do the, you know, the pinball effect, go wall to wall and destroy that machine? You know, so what we've done is with that car is I used to, you know, it's a clutch car. I manually shift the car. I mean, it's got buttons, but, you know, shift light comes on, shift the car to second, shift light comes on, goes to third. And with a clutch, you've got to be bang on. And I was inconsistent with my shift, and I was either 100 RPM high or low on the shift. So it could, it, either if you shift too high, the clutch is too tight between the gear chains. If you shift too low, it's too loose between the gear chains. So excuse me, because we're running so quick and so strong, and like I said, we end up qualifying number three in St. Louis, the guy said, look, man, let's go to Vegas. Let's try to win this race. Let's put an auto shift in this car where the car will shift, be more consistent. So we put an auto shift in the car so it shifts off RPM. That was the first pass on the car. The car went out, hooked up within 1.2 seconds, spun the tire, went to the gear change, shifted, went into second gear. So the inertia, the tire was on fire, hit in second gear. Now you've got that mechanical ratio now driving that tire that much quicker. And it happened so fast. By the time I had a chance to even lift the throttle, push the clutch and aboard the run, the car was already sideways heading towards the wall. And it was a hard lick. I'm glad you got out of it all right. And, you know, you're still – obviously racing today, looking forward to going faster and winning, winning Wally soon. I hope that's soon for you. I'm way happen. overdue, man. Way overdue. I need a wall of Wally's, man. I've been, you know, I was at Jim Whiteley's house last January in 2019. And between him and his wife, Annie, they custom built the wall with Wally's. Uh, there must've been 150 Wally's in the house. And then had a whole bunch still sitting in boxes they couldn't even put in the house. That's the only races they want. So God bless them. They've done great. But I need to get my hands on a wall. I got a whole bunch of IHRA Ironmans and uh, PDRA. You know, I've got a PDRA, a couple of trophies. Actually, one PDRA. PMRA is what I meant to say. A whole bunch of them. I don't have a Wally. I need to get my hands on one of those. Well, I know you want that Wally. It is hard to get a Wally, though, with the competition that is out there. And I have to say as well that the carnage that there can absolutely be in NHRA Pro Mod. Look, from a Pro Mod driver and owner, I haven't been able to ask this yet, so I'll throw it out to you first. It seems like these cars, and not just Pro Mod, but door cars in particular, are having some funny aerodynamic effects happen to them at high speeds now. Do you guys in the pits talk about what needs to be done to make the cars safer, or do y'all feel that you're confident that they're as safe as they can be? No, I think the cars are great. The only thing I've been having a problem with, and it doesn't matter how you pack the chutes, it doesn't matter what kind of spring launchers you got. My green car, that 69 Camaro, the G-Force car in 2013 in Las Vegas, chutes came out, twisted up, tangled up, car ended up in the sand. 27, 2018, driving uh, a 69 Chevelle, one of Jim Whiteley's cars, in, in Norwalk, Ohio, same deal, shoots tangled, twisted up, wrapped around the rear end houses, snapped the brake line fitting out of the caliper and had absolutely no brakes. Here I am with my new car, 
You see me there two weeks ago, three weeks ago in, in Gainesville. I uh, sorry, in Orlando. Shoots come out, twist all up, tangled up. Stevie Jackson goes out, twist up, ends up hitting the wall. I just, you know, either we need, and I know it's hard because these racetracks have been built and they've always had a certain amount of real estate. But man, I'll tell you, it'd be really nice if we can have a racetrack that has enough room to stop without the chutes in case they didn't open up and have the chutes to save on the brakes. But hey, we can't stop. The problem with the sand, man, people are getting hurt. Mark Caruso got hurt, fractured his back. Cars are being destroyed, written off. Mike Bowman destroyed the 69 Chevelle. I mean, the stuff is really nasty. Knock on wood, I've been lucky all three times, front end damage only, no other damage to the car. But, uh, you know, you know, it'd be nice that as they rebuild the racetracks, take a little bit of real estate up and let's have a little more space to stop these cars. I mean, God, we used to run pro mods when they used to run 620s. I can tell you, 620, 220 mile an hour, no shoots. I stopped, no problems at all. But at 250, you're not stopping. You're not, you're not. Well, that's something, you know, a lot of drag strips have had the growing pains, or I'll say rather speed pains of all these cars going that much faster, and yet they were planted in the 1960s. So definitely that presents a challenge. Will you bring that up? Let me throw this out there. Are there some tracks that you as a pro mod driver go to that you would rather click it off at a thousand feet and this? Do you think the NHRA, not only the NHRA, but other drag strips as well, need to really look at maybe a modern way of stopping the cars beyond the sand and the net? Yeah, it'd be great. Again, a longer shutdown would be awesome. Um, I just don't see any other way they can do it. I mean, it wouldn't be so bad like when you look at these F-17 fighter planes, you know, when they go in an aircraft carrier, right? What do they do? As they land, they come up, the hook grabs them, spring loads them, and stops them. I don't know if there's any kind of device we can have at the end of the track that's attached to some big elastic band that you hook in to stop the vehicle. I, I can't imagine them ever doing that. There's a lot of short tracks out there. Like Orlando, I like it. Guys are great. It's a nice track, but it is definitely short. Um, Norwalk's got a bit of a short runway as well, come to a stop. Gainesville's great. Gainesville's got a big, long runway, so you don't see too many guys go off the end of the racetrack in Gainesville. Uh, in Gainesville. So, um, again, it's hard because these tracks were built, some of these tracks were built in the 60s and 70s. They were old, aborted, you know, abandoned air, air, airports. And at the end of these runways, there's people's homes and backyards and all. So, it, it makes it difficult. But, you know, the car, unless we start running our cars to 1,000 feet, Maybe we do the same thing the fuel cars do. You know, I don't like eighth mile racing, but I think a thousand foot is, is far enough. So if we can build our cars to run a thousand feet, just like the pro, you know, the top fuel cars do, then I'd be totally fine with that. Definitely got to think about safety and you all guys getting stopped. It, I'm sure it is not enjoyable to hit that net at full speed or, you know, go through the net. I mean, you know, in Columbus, Ohio, it was famous. The farmer would remove his fence every national event. So when they did go through the net, they would land in his front yard. His fence wouldn't be destroyed. So, yeah, you believe so that? definitely think for you guys, you got to take some, some, some proactive steps so we don't have more incidents like Mark Caruso or what happened at Pomona with the nostalgia funny car and him flipping completely over and yeah. being trapped for a while. So definitely, yeah. I think for you guys, we've got to look into that. Now, Eric, look, the whole world in essence is on lockdown right now with the coronavirus. How is that impacting business for you right now? And what are things like there in Canada? So we are an essential. So we, because we supply the emission controls for the transportation industry, um, we're actually told to stay open and we're supplying as much as product as we can right now. So we're in full blow. So our sales team is working from home. We don't have them here. We've got them all staying home, but we're in full production in the back plant and all of the logistics support team is here. Myself, I come in every day. Actually, after I left, Gainesville, because of the travel, I quarantined myself for 15 days at home, came back to work actually last Monday. So I worked a full week last week, came in today. 
but uh, we're keeping our distance. Um, it's hard. Yesterday was my birthday. My birthday yesterday celebrated on my own, my wife and I, and uh, you know, my son wanted to, my kids wanted to come over and we told him to stay away. My son, Matt, had just passed by because he had to come by and grab something. So kept our distance. He came and grabbed what he had to grab and, and off he went. But uh, it's pretty serious. A lot of people are dying, you know, and there's a lot of people that are going to lose their businesses. Restaurants, bars are uh, having a real hard time. I feel for them. Uh, but so far for us, knock on wood, we're, we're there and we've been established a while. So if we had to close our doors for the next three or four months, we would survive. We'd have to put our staff on uh, unemployment, as we call it. Uh, there are a lot of great government programs. Our banks have come to us and said, look, or the Bank of Canada support us through the government has offered us whatever we want. I mean, my bank offered us a $2 million loan, interest only year one, pay back the 40% by year two and three, pay off the balance of the 60. We haven't taken advantage of it, but the funding is there if we need it. But, uh, you know, it, like I said, there's uh, restaurants that are paying, uh, you know, rent and the poor staff that work on tips only, they're gonna, they're having a real hard time. So it, and the whole world's like that. So I, I, I really feel for them. I really feel for everybody out there. So I hope they can all make it through. And uh, I just wish the government, again, world government supports all these companies and keeps them going. I mean, how many people are off in the US right now? A couple of million. In Canada alone, we have over a million people unemployed right now. And we're only 30 million people strong in the whole country. And there's over 120 million people in the United States. So there's got to be at least eight, 10 million, eight to 10 million people unemployed right now. Technically, I'm one of those. The part-time job I have in the morning, they haven't had me come in since I got off the plane from, you know, Gainesville myself. And I didn't want to go anywhere myself, too, because I wanted to self-quarantine, make sure there was a report that the night before at the Rochester International Airport that a Delta flight did have a confirmed case of coronavirus, you know, with an individual. So, you know, definitely I wanted to lock myself away and be safe for everyone else and for myself. And you did that. It's got great implications in business, in our society. Look, it also has had implications to the racing schedule. What are your thoughts on the schedule changes with the NHRA? I tell you, I, I miss it, man. I want to get out so bad. I wait all winter to get out and race. So I believe – from what I hear, you know, it was very optimistic, you know, when President Trump was kind of hoping that we'd all be back to work by, um, um, all back to normal by Easter. And that's just based on what the experts were telling him. But frankly, the way things are going around the world, I wouldn't be surprised if it's not until Indy before we get to our first race. And at that point, I don't even know how do you run a four or five race season. So it's one of those deals where do you pull the plug on the whole year, park everything till next year, or does any jury try to finish off from September on? Because, hey, you know, the pro classes have been out there. I think they've done four races so far. How many races? Two, two. Oh, wow, two. All right, so two, and then if they get their uh, September in till, they, till Vegas, they'll give them another, I guess, seven. So they'll be doing like nine to ten. NHRA Pro Mod would be doing four. So, I don't know. It's a tough call. Uh, again, going back to what I think, it's going to be September before I think this whole world uh, goes back to normal. Well, thank you for that estimation. I hope it is not a reality, though. I definitely hope. I know you hope we get what back do you think? sooner. What are you thinking, Lee? What are you thinking, Ria? What do you? I know what you're hoping, and how do you feel about everything? What is it like on your side? on the U.S. side and, and all the talks going on. I mean, New York City is hit really hard. I mean, New yes. York State is a big state, but from what I understand, 88% of what hit New York State is in New York City. Right, right. So me in Monroe County, uh, the, the, the principal municipality being Rochester, I think there's been 28 confirmed cases. It's really not that bad. You know, folks are in an under lockdown, you know, it definitely New York City is the hot spot. You know, I have family that lives in South Carolina. They haven't hardly experienced anything. You know, one of my concerns, and I think what is going to push back 
the racing season is the South hasn't seen the major wave of people catching this virus. And some of the earliest races are where they're in the Southeast. And I think that's going to present a challenge to have any major venues and the curve really began racking up in the southern United States. So a lot of where it is right now, you don't have racing going on anyway because it still isn't good weather. And where we will get to that's going to be good weather, well, the virus really hasn't hit there, it seems like. And it may very well. So, yes, it, I, I hope it's not September. I hope it's earlier. But I think that is a realistic estimation, definitely, definitely. Yeah. So, look, Eric. Whenever we do get back to racing, whenever we do get back to racing, let me give you the last words for and on this interview. Tell me, for your fans, for your partners, and also to your competitors, why should they be looking out for Eric Latino? Because we've spent the past year on a whole bunch of programs. We got some really good, strong support. Uh, our sponsors. So North Star Battery, who's been our supporting sponsor for the past four years, has now been bought up through by the Enersys Group, which is now Odyssey. So we've gone from a $300 million a company to a $3 billion a company, which means my race budget's gone up. So we got a few more dollars to go racing with. Jesse's been really helping out. The company's coming around. So we got a little more support there too. And we're just becoming smarter. So for me right now, I'm able to spend more time. You know that soft story I was telling you earlier about working too much and not enough time to go racing? It's starting to slowly work around the other way. So I've got a lot more control. The business runs on its own. I can be away from this place and nothing changes. These guys I have here are doing an awesome job. So I'm going to focus. I'm going to try to put a little more time into racing, get a little more time into doing a little more testing. Hey, I'm competitive. I'm competitive in business, I've been competitive all my life. Um, I'm not happy. Uh, I was, I guess I was okay last year. Performance was okay, but I was hoping to do much better. So I made a lot of commitments to my team this year. Um, yeah, I'll fucking tell you, Lee, I could tell you that we, this year, you know, people say, hey, you know, I want to qualify. Hey, I want to be on the top half of the field. Well, my, uh, my, my faith and belief this year for us is we want to be in the top five. We want to qualify in the top five. We want to go rounds. We want to go to semis. We want to go to finals. We want to win races. That's our goal this year. Well, there it is. Eric Latino, a goal of being a top five team in NHRA Pro Mod. Folks, you the drag racing fan, I'm Lee Kraft, the Monday Morning Racer. This is for Drag Racing TV, brought to you by the suspension experts who love drag racing, strutmasters.com. Till next time, God bless and keep the pedal to the metal.